and I don't know what the f God is, but yeah, there's something out there that responds to the human voices. You know, I just want people to feel like they've been to church, uh, or better, when they've been to a show. And I can even eat my dinner in a fancy restaurant. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Jeff Edgers, the National Arts Reporter at The Washington Post, and uh, we are so lucky today to have uh, acclaimed artist and now best-selling author, Sinead O'Connor with us, uh, coming to us from Ireland. And uh, she is the author of the new book, Rememberings, uh, which chronicles her decades as an artist and her roots and her, uh, her start. And um, Sinead, we're so glad to have you here. Thank you, thank you for being with thank the you. Washington Post. Thank you. No, not at all, Jesus. It's lovely. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, Sinead, um, as you know, a few days ago you retired, and uh, and then you unretired, and you said this. You said I lied when I said I'm past my peak, which I've seen you perform recently, and I agree with you. Um, yeah, yeah. Do you know what? I, I I for for thirty years, or at least since the Pope business. Every time I go to work to sell a record or a book or whatever or show, all anybody wants to know about is, uh, you know, upsetting things, you know, very upsetting things and uh, uh, on the grounds that I suffer from mental health conditions as a result of the violence I went through growing up, I get treated like shit and I have to kind of wade through oceans of prejudice and stigma, you know, every day to make a living. And that's depressing, you know, so there was a couple of interviews where I, I had also, uh, the publishers had several times requested that journalists wouldn't, uh, would be sensitive not to perhaps re-traumatise me by digging into the abuse issue much. And some of them ignored that and it was all a bit triggering. I didn't expect that um, talking about the book would, would bring, it was it's actually a huge catharsis, you know, which is a good thing. But anyway, there was a particularly hurtful interview about a week ago and for the for all the years that I've got treated like this several times I've retired and it's actually because you know what it's so um it's so demeaning having to you know answer questions about whether you're sane or not or being invalidated on the grounds that you suffer from the symptoms of trauma do you know what I'm saying so yeah I mean I, I, you know so one of your heroes uh two of your heroes Van Morrison is one of them and uh, uh Bob Dylan um they found a solution to this which is they never do interviews right they um, do like one interview happening. Every yeah well that's what's happening after this book promo is done everybody has promised me that i don't have to do any promo for the album coming out or anything like that because i terribly triggering it's weird it always has been over the years because even watching for example the beautiful thing that you just made about my history and the things you know it's lovely but it's it's triggering it's weird it's weird you know not all it's actually a really good thing it's a blessing in disguise because all of my life when i in recovery the therapists and the doctors etc they always say and that this is common in abuse survivors that you know i could tell you about something dreadful that happened but i wouldn't have any feelings about it you know of course, you have, you're dissociated. So, you know, part of recovery is associating, and that's what's happened as a result of, you know, talking about the books. So that's a good thing, but it means I'm terribly fragile. So there was a particularly nasty bitch, God forgive me, who was just demeaning me, saying dreadful insults about mental health and all that stuff. And uh, you know, I, I just want to. I, I I hope. Hey, no, I'm sorry. Every time happens over the years i've retired every time somebody's just hurt me so bad that i don't want to fucking be in the business for you know but then a couple of days later i was like you know what fuck that bitch so i got revenge by writing a writing a letter about it on my um web page so once i've got revenge i'm, I'm cool you know <laughs> so um yeah i'm a mad bitch like that's that's the thing so yeah i mean i don't mean that in a bad way i mean with respect you know but you know I got terribly hurt, and I didn't want to, you know. It's a hard, well, it's, it's, a, it's, hurt, it's a hurtful thing being in the music business and constantly being defined by as if you're mad, mental health, and as if being mad is bad, 
and or makes you somehow dangerous and you get treated like a Russian dancing bear, the kind of mocking and invalidating and putting you down, you know, kind of shit. So that, that made me want to run away a million times over the years, you know. But it, so it's a hard, it's a hard job, you know, you're wading through walls and this is true for everybody listening and of course who suffers from mental health issues, but to go to go to work or to live your day, you, you have to wade through walls of fucking prejudice, which even comes into your own fucking head, you know. Let, let me ask you, you um, uh, um, I, I know you're a consumer of news and you follow all current events. I'm sure you've well, watched what's America, happened with um, only, only, only in America. I don't follow current events, even in my own country. God forgive me. All I do is I watch American CNN 24 hours a day. So let me ask you: When it comes to trauma and how people deal with it, I mean, you've seen what's happened with Naomi Osaka, um, yeah. great tennis player who. She's like, I mean, and I love her. I, you know, respect her, of course. Like, but so I'm not saying anything about her, but like. The way the media are dealing with her is so respectful, but to deal with me, um, if they they treat me like a dancing bear, they it's horrible to live that way, you know. But what can we uh, What can we do better as as the media to? I mean, you've done it beautifully in this book. The idea of sort of helping destigmatize mental illness and make people feel more powerful about speaking out. What can the media do better? How do they improve that? Because there is obviously that Dr. Phil quotient out there that just want to get clicks and want to get attention. Well, I suppose it's different for everyone. Like, I, I'm not sure are you ask me, what do I think is the trick? Like, I guess what one thing obviously is media could stop portraying in, in movies or TV or anything, uh, and even the news. Uh, where, where there's a mass shooting, everybody says, oh, the person is mentally ill. That's bollocks. There's a difference between evil and mental illness. So that, that labels us, we're stigmatized. People are afraid going to work. It's basically, it's like being a person who has two broken legs, but everybody expects you to walk normal. And if you don't walk normal, you might lose your job. You might lose your girlfriend or your kids, you know, whatever, you know. And if you don't walk normal, people jump on your broken legs. And then when you scream and shout, they, they use that against you. Do you know what I'm saying? You're constantly in a, it's like a fucking horrible video game. So media need to stop. Um, I think one of the things, you know, I had an idea, and it sounds funny, but I'm not joking. Of of um, coffee mornings with crazy people, right? <laughs> that in your in your town, you would once a month or something in the park, everybody could go and meet people who have all the different mental illnesses and and chat and get to know each other. The trouble is, because everyone's so afraid. The, the reason everyone's so afraid of mental illness is um, the way the media has portrayed it. You know, as if we're scary and all that crap, you know, and dangerous. Um, or invalid, you know. So one of the people don't uh, engage with people who have mental health illnesses, and they they don't understand the illnesses. Like media constantly portray multiple personality disorder as if it's schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a completely different condition. Also, media constantly portray people with schizophrenia or whatever as you know monsters, you know dangerous and all. That's complete bollocks. Nothing like it, you know. Uh, let me, can I ask you? I, I I want to ask you about your your performing because that's a very important I think, thing. I think the media. I think the media could do an awful lot if they encouraged people to engage with, you know, you know people of mental illness and and find out that they're they're perfectly valid people, you know. But like the, the biggest, you... one of the biggest problems when you again are at this person with two broken legs and everyone expects you to walk normal, like. You, you wouldn't believe the, the millions of people that are going to work every day doing whatever jobs they do, having to walk normal, you know, for fear they lose their job or their house or their mortgage. You know, so we're we're all we're constantly put under pressure not to show any symptoms. You know, in fact, even I'll tell you some, uh, something that my publisher will kill me for telling you, but I'm going to tell you like but before I started promo for this book, um, it, there was a request came in that I do a mock interview with the publicist uh, of some sort so that, quote, uh, they could see was I going to say anything whack or was I going to come across crazy? 
And then that really upset me. In fact, I stopped crying for a whole weekend because that's asking someone with two broken legs to walk normal, you know. And then I then I sent them the James Brown interview on CNN after the fucking car chase. I was like, hey, you know, how come James Brown can act like a fucking lunatic on CNN and I, and I can't, you know, or somebody else can't go to work, you know, with their crutches and having to fucking walk normal, you know. Let, let me ask you, um, uh, uh, I, I thought when you talked about your retirement, one thing I thought of is so, so much of what you do and so much of who you are is defined by what you've written and been able to sing over the years. And one thing I thought was, um, uh, you know, one, was it cathartic at all to write this down as a book? This is, by the way, a beautiful book. I mean, it's like a, a it's very poetic. And I love the fact that you wrote it. Uh, you didn't get some hack like me to help out. Uh, and, and, and two, um, I thought uh, this is someone who, who, who doesn't just sing, she needs to sing. I've watched you perform and I feel this intensity that comes from you that is, is I don't know if it's healing or cathartic. We use that word too much, but um, uh, tell me about how you deal with your life and, and struggles with music and with this book. Well. Um, when I was writing the book, it wasn't a catharsis. I didn't have any feelings, as I explained earlier. I, I was completely diso dissociated. I was afraid. I didn't. So, yeah, I didn't. Um, there was no catharsis writing it. I, I just wrote it and I didn't get it didn't trigger anything. I was frightened to read the audio book because I thought it would be triggering, but it wasn't at all, except for really the Prince chapter, because I had not, in fact, engaged at the time with how fucking frightening that was, and you know, so I had to go to bed for a couple of days after that one. Um, but the catharsis is now coming. Thanks be to God. God works in mysterious ways. The, these journalists that have been a bit in, insensitive and in digging into, you know, re-traumatizing me, it has, that has been the catharsis. It's, it's all coming up now. All the stuff that I told you earlier that the therapists for years are saying, you know, we'd like you to feel your bloody feelings, if you don't mind. <laughs> well, it's happening now, do you know what I mean? And that's a good thing, you know, but it's it's uh, not easy, do you know what I mean? But it's it's a blessing, you know. So when you talk Sorry. about retiring, it feels like you need to sing. Am I right about that? I mean, it, it, it feels like something you can't just cut out of your life. Yeah, exactly. It's it's a bit like having a row with your husband and you say, you know, I'll fuck off. Or, or you know, two days later, you're like, oh, I'm sorry. You know, it's a bit like that, I guess. But do I need to sing? It's a very good question. I think that what I like and why you see me get fiery when I'm on stage is that I feel strongly about the audience that to art, to most artists it should be the case and it is with me that the audience is the most important person in in my life artistically so the I I guess I love that t turning up and doing what I do because I know that the people there are finding something um, encouraging and healing in it. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's kind of like music as a priesthood, uh, music as a priesthood, you know, I've been really inspired by the Rastafari movement in, in that regard, you know, the idea of music as a priesthood, you know. And I think people like Dylan are priests and Van, they don't know they are, maybe, maybe they do. But when I go on stage, there's a there's two prayers I say every night. I say first I say, Jesus, don't let me make a fool of myself. You know, and the, or God, don't don't let me make a fool of myself. And then the next is I, I want to be a priest. So I, I want to feel I, I, what I love. It's not so much that I need to sing. I need to be a priest, and that's how I go about it. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. There's so some, I, I, some, and, yeah. So priests are very, very by necessity extraordinarily flawed human beings. You don't have to be perfect. It's just that hopefully by you, if, if you look at Dylan or Van, not that I'm comparing myself to them, but there are certain artists that just by them, you know, there's a God, you know? And I think yeah, that which, happens um, sometimes. You know, I, I want to ask you about, um, you know, obviously you see the uh, the clip of you tearing up the picture of the Pope a hundred times a day, right? I mean, it's just, it's just mm. played over and over. And uh, mm. the reason is because it was a very significant pop cultural moment and we all paid attention to it. But now, as you know, people are reinterpreting it and they're saying, boy, how did she know all that? 
And I know there were, you explained beautifully that this wasn't just motivated by your knowledge of, of child I, abuse I actually, in Ireland. Yeah. Sorry, go on. But Sorry, did I you, did, when you when you see the, when you see the way people are talking about it now, because I know you see it on the internet, people are saying, "Hey, Sinead was right. Uh, why didn't we listen?" Do you say, "Oh, I, I feel like I'm I'm finally they get it," or is there more to it? Well, it's never mattered really to me if anybody get it. I understood I understood at the time why people didn't get it. The thing about America that's quite sweet, amongst many things is um, that you guys think something hasn't happened unless it's happened in America. <laughs> so you didn't know for 10 years like after the Pope incident, you know, that this was going on. I understood why people were so bloody horrified they couldn't possibly contemplate the idea. I mean, it was shocking, the idea that there could be priests that were abusers and worse, the so-called sane people covering it up, you know. But to be fair now, I have to be honest, I didn't know much about it. I only saw a teeny tiny paragraph in, in some newspaper, I can't even remember where, about it was at very em embryonic stages of the whole church thing. Um, it was a fa about families who had made reports to the cops, but then when they had gone to the cops to follow it up, the cops had lost, you know, couldn't find the documents, the statements and blah, blah, you know, they were being stalled. That's all I saw. But the book explains the rest of it, you know. Well, I mean, in the picture, it's remarkable that photograph of the Pope was when your mother died uh, uh, tragically in a car accident, you plucked that mm. photograph off of her wall and mm. swirled it away. Uh, yeah. I, I guess not, not knowing that moment was going to occur on Saturday. And a lot, a lot, I mean, why did you, what was your idea of what that photo would be at some point? Did you know? Well, you know, first I have to say, you know, it was a great thing about live TV in those days. And I have a feeling because of me, they, they created the three second delay between California and the other side of America with Saturday Night Live. But it was great because punks like live TV, do you know, they didn't really fucking do anything on live TV. <laughs> and so that was part of it as well. But I took the photo because, you know, that, the Pope, that guy came to Ireland when I was a child. He kissed the ground when he got off the plane as if the flight had been terrifying. And then he gets up and says, young people of Ireland, I love you. And of course, nobody bloody loved us, actually. And there was no love going on at all. And that Catholicism was crushing, you know, the very essence of life in people via sexuality. You know, their, their perverse ideas about sexuality that they tried to drill into people, especially in Ireland. It's almost like they've had an experiment here. You know? So um, people like my mother, God rest her soul, um, the, what am I trying to say? Catholicism was making people in Ireland either into monsters or being miserable. There was no love at all. It was a grey, dark fucking theocracy, a miserable place. So yeah, when he gets up and says, young people of Ireland, I love you, like, fuck off, like, what the fuck? And also, <laughs> Why are you driving around in a in a uh, uh, you know protective vehicle? If if you are good in your heart, why do you think anybody would want to shoot you? You know, think think about it. Why would you want to get into such a vehicle unless you had something that you were afraid of? You know, you know if you understand what I'm saying. You know, so the the falsity of the whole thing. You know, the the crushing of Irish people by the church. In fact, you know, the football teams having to kneel down before matches and kiss the ring of the bishop. You know, the streets parting like the Red Seas when the bishop walked down the street. You know, pe people being told just the most awful lies about the devil and God. My father was told at school several times by a priest when he was about seven years of age, my father, in the classroom, the priest says, um, once there was a boy who didn't go to confession and you know, what happened was he had an, didn't he die in a, in a fire and didn't he go straight to hell? And what happened was the, the, in, the priest said um, that, oh, my, my bedclothes burned and everything. And when they cleaned up the room, they found two little burned handprints on my bedclothes, you know. Oh. The boy had come back from hell screaming to, you know, finally be get a confession. This is the kind of shit they were drilling into people, you know, bashing the kids at school 
telling the parents it's like sex was a bad thing from 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 the moment you're born as a Catholic, you're a sinner because your parents made love to create you. The very essence of life, beautiful sexuality, all life comes from it. Yeah, <laughs> they they crush that in the people, you know. And we had wars and everything going on here, and fucking we never heard a word from the Pope. We had bloody four wars going on at the same time, and they're they're still going on, you know. Hey, Sinead, I want to, um, uh, and I wish we could talk for hours, by the way, but they only allow me to talk to you for half an hour. So um, uh, I want to show you something. I made this when I got, I, I saw you in March of 2020 before the pandemic struck. I thought we were going to see you back in the States on your tour, but I had this made by this amazing outsider artist because this is a lyric, Black Boys on Mopeds. I'll send you one if you want. It's yeah. on a board, it's on a wooden board. It's like yeah. folk art. Yeah. I don't look very pretty in it, obviously, but I don't look very pretty anyway. But I look much worse in that. Oh, <laughs> um, but I like it. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. I actually love it. It's beautiful. Oh, look, your typewriter. Remember I, I said know. I wanted you. I tried to blackmail you into giving me a typewriter. But you've got exactly the one behind you. It's the one that I have. You don't have to black. You don't black. No blackmail. I'll, I'll get you one. But look, that song, Black Boys on Mopeds, you write that in the early 90s, late 80s, I, whatever uh, it is. I mean, this lyric. Is there a danger? These are dangerous days to say what you feel is to make your own grave. I mean, these are incredibly, it's as if you're telling the future, or maybe it's just the way the li life has always been. When you watch things like you have your Black Lives Matter shirt on, you say, uh, again, why did these people in the United States not understand how messed up things were and how much we needed to fix them? Because we're evolving, you know, things don't happen quickly. We're, you know, if you say that we're made in the image of God, God is evolving also. We're evolving along with it. We're all part of it. We're just growing. These things were bubbling under for years, and at least they're being talked about. They're being talked through, and people are getting to express their their pain or their you know, hope, you know, people are getting to talk about it. And, you know, look, people being killed in black people for fucking centuries. You know, people been putting them down, making them feel like a piece of shit. And, you know, it, 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 it it's always been there. I get very sad when I, it's actually beautiful, though. But when, the, the song that gets the most, um, you know, applause from the audience when I first start singing the lines is actually Black Boys and Mopeds. It's more popular than Nothing Compares. And that's gorgeous. But I always am thinking every night, oh, my God, isn't it sad that this is still so fucking relevant, you know, after 30 years? That's sad. So, you know, but I guess people are, you know, it's a, I think it has a lot to do with religion. If you look at it, like people have not been taught to love each other. You never hear a politician say the word love. You know, people haven't been taught, you know, it was dangerous in America back in the 60s when people bloody loved each other and they were prepared to sit in the street and get killed if they had to. You know, but people have been made so busy trying to pay the rent and the mortgage and one check away from you know, homeless, um, you know, no no time to, to think of others uh, or to the will to be willing to die for the sake of others, you know, and um, no spirituality, no, none of the religions are, are saying, you know, let's get and sit in the street and do a Gandhi on it and just sit there. And if they're going to kill us, OK, kill us. But, but you know, non-violent, you know, non-compliant. If everybody in America got out in the streets for one day, the whole thing would bloody change because the, the powers that be would lose so much money on that one day. <laughs> you know, it, it, do you know what I'm saying? We don't we don't love each other enough to sit in the street and die for each other, you know? And, and well, you, you, you said in America, America, you said you, you used, America defined that very idea in the 60s of, of you know, loving your neighbor. You know, we, we uh, beautifully put it up early in this, uh, the quote from your book, but it's, I'll just read it again because I think it's an important point. Uh, because you're talking about how the, how the moment on Saturday Night Live didn't ruin you, it saved you. It, it, it recovered you in some way. But you write, everyone wants a pop star, see? But I am a protest singer. I just had to get stuff off my chest. And so uh, I'd love to understand as, as you look at it, uh, do you look back at that time period, that that point where you were on the top of the pop charts when, you know, look, this record, I got George Harrison holding it. Uh, but you're you're you know, this thing was like the biggest album of all time when I was 19 years old. And I still listen to it 
often because it's beautifully written. But you look back at that time strangely and say, boy, what, what was I doing there on these award shows or, uh, you know, on the pop charts? I was embarrassed. I feel like I was embarrassed, you know, and, and I don't know if that was impolite of me, perhaps, you know, but I, I, I just was uncomfortable with it. I don't know why. I, I guess because, you know, it's like oil, oil and water or whatever they say. What is it? Oil and something don't mix. So, yeah, I, I guess, um, you know, the whole pop thing, it's a very vampiric arena. And it's almost as if you did you ever meet someone where for for some reason you just didn't get on with them, your energy didn't work together, it was something not right. It, it's a bit like that for me when I was in the pop thing. It just I, I couldn't be whatever the hell it was I was supposed to be, you know. And as I said in the book, nobody asked me what the fuck I wanted, you know. So the, it, it derailed perhaps the dreams of a whole lot of record executives. Do you know what I mean? Mostly male, obviously, in fact, entirely male in those days. And um, they they want to prostitute you. And I wasn't comfortable with, with being a prostitute or expected to be a prostitute, you know? Well, the way, you, I mean, the, you, you, you write it. With that. You write it beautifully in the book. I mean, the, the moment that the record executive tells this 19-year-old uh, to uh, wear some nice little short skirts and uh, grow her hair out, you go to the barber and say, cut it all off, right? <laughs> yeah, well, that was my manager at the time. He said to me, oh, I think you should fucking shave it. So I had like a mohawk, a mohawk anyway. So yeah, so I, I like the chapter in the book about the um, the shaving of the head because it's, it's a very funny chapter because the Greek barber, he was a young man himself, probably only a bit older than me, like, and he was having a freak out about doing it. And so the whole scenario was quite funny. And in fact, he, at the very end of it, when he did it, it, it was like the nothing compares to you video. One little tear <laughs> came down his face because he was so horrified of doing it. The, um, uh, <laughs> you, know, you know, I'll tell you that the one thing that I hope that people will understand from this book is it's also like you, you have a great sense of humor you have a great command of language and comedy language, I'd say. You have a way of giving us even the Prince uh, scenario where Prince really, it's a horrifying and scaring uh, uh, experience, but the way you tell it is with humor at times and with just, a, it's just beautifully written. Um, Sinead, we only have a couple think, more. For me, the Prince chapter is the best chapter in the book, I feel. Yeah. Well, it's, it's beautifully yeah. done. Um, I, I, we only have a couple more minutes. I want to ask you, you talk at the end of this book, and I know that we talked about it too, going to get your degree as a healthcare assistant and wanting to yeah. uh, spend time with people who are, who are dying. And you're talking about calling this new album that you're going to put out next year, No Veteran Dies Alone. Um, explain yeah. that to people who don't. We're used to our heroes in arts sitting on an island and gazing out at the sunset or, you know, getting treated like royalty. <laughs> Tell me about sitting in a room with a dying 92 year old veteran on his, on his oxygen and why, what that means to you, why you're doing that. Well, look, thanks be to God, none of my guys actually died. I had a, I had a little voluntary job in, in Waukegan, in, uh, around Waukegan, there was a, a veteran hospital um, and it was a program called No Veteran Dies Alone, where there were soldiers of, of all kind of ages who, for one reason or another, perhaps they'd outlived their families uh, or for one reason or another, their family couldn't be there or whatever. The idea was you would make friends with them and you'd kind of do the things they might like, you know, if they want hot dog at four in the morning or whatever. Um, and then the idea is that you are the person who sits with them while they make the transition. And uh, it's beautiful what they do in the, in the veteran hospital. There's a, a, a lovely salute and kind of trumpets and everybody stands when the man is or woman is in character. So, but I only had the job for maybe about three or four weeks. So luckily, I, I, God forgive me, I didn't, um, thank God, have to go through them actually dying, which I think would have hurt me because I loved um, the one man in particular, um, that I was working with and uh, he was a Syrian man but Syrian American and he was 92 and just I loved him so much that I, I think thank god I wasn't there when he died because it would broke my heart <laughs> 
so that's why you know if you're going to do that kind of work you would need to clear your own griefs you know because you can't be falling apart but the reason that i wanted to call the album no veteran dies alone is to advertise the program no veteran dies alone it's a voluntary program it's run in the veteran hospitals all over america and they're looking for people to come in and just be friend and you know be brave enough to do that you know so it's a great program so the album title is a pure um advert for the for the program you know okay well look i again i would talk to you for three or four hours and uh, i hope we will talk again soon this is the book it's a great book folks uh it really is it's a wonderfully written book i'm not going to give you my copy i've taken some notes um <laughs> And I know you're going to be touring again soon, and you're going to be putting out a new album. And we're, look, you're yeah. a great person and a, and a great artist, and um, uh, we really look forward to everything that you do. Thank you. And I really, I'm so um, overwhelmed at how, how loving everybody's been about it. But I'm a really, really uh, like I'm like can't, I can't believe it. It's weird. The same as when the record, when the you know the glory days, as I call it, you know. I kind of couldn't couldn't believe like you know why why would people be interested you know what I mean or there's been so much love about it it's lovely you know well uh, we we so look forward to anything else we can we can hear from you and I'll get you I'll get you some records okay and um, okay cool oh, yeah, we were going to ask well. people to send records I I need some vinyls guys everybody out there so send them to Jeff <laughs> and I'll get them to him if you send me a record I'll, I'll be really happy because I just got a record player and I've got hardly any records. <laughs> this hasn't normally been how things are arranged with Washington Post live guests, but folks, my email's on the internet, write me, send send me your records, and I'll send them to Sinead, okay? Within reason. No, no trip yeah, off, no, okay? I, 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 I like blues and country. I don't like a dance. I do like trance, but don't send me any fucking bullshit, you know? I like Russell. Okay, none of that. No, no, none of that effing bullshit. Okay. Hey, folks, come back Wednesday at 11 o'clock on Washington Post live. We have uh, my colleague Paige Winfield Cunningham will be talking about the global vaccine rollout. And uh, look, have a, a wonderful afternoon and thanks so much for being here.